It started with just a few lakes. Each year, fishermen reported fewer and fewer fish, until finally, there were none. The lakes are still and beautiful, their waters crystal clear, because with the exception of a few species of acid-tolerant plants and animals, they have been swept clean of life. Vegetation sinks to the bottom and remains for years, pickled in acid. At least 500 lakes in the United States and Canada are dead, and the number grows year by year. In Norway and Sweden, there are over 20,000 dead lakes. Scientists have been studying this forest in Vermont for over 20 years. Over that period, 65% of the red spruce trees have died after having withstood the storms and droughts of centuries. There are fewer young trees of all species. Changes in man-made things are accelerated. Copper and other metals corrode. Stone is decomposed. And marble turns into talc. Our monuments to the past are being slowly erased. As to our monuments to the future, no one knows the long-term effect of acid rain on human health. We know that particles associated with acid rain inhibit the lungs' natural defenses against disease. At high concentrations, they can be deadly. Japan, in 1972, experienced an extreme episode of air pollution. Photochemical smog combined with high levels of sulfur dioxide. Such incidents paved the way for stricter controls on air pollution. This is an electron microscope picture of the acid in polluted air. The tiny droplets are almost pure sulfuric acid. Chemists measure acidity with this instrument, called a pH meter. Distilled water is neutral, with a pH of 7. Human blood, milk, and seawater have pH values close to 7. They are in the middle life-supporting range. Substances below pH 7 are called acidic. The lower the pH, the stronger the acid. Rain has fallen with the acidity of lemon juice, pH 2. This laboratory setup can show us how such a thing can come about. It is a closed system just as our planet is a closed system. Here, water is heated and rises as steam. As in nature, water heated by the sun evaporates and rises as invisible vapor. Mixing with cooler air, it forms clouds. And cooling further, the water condenses, returns to its liquid state, and falls as rain or snow. Some of this water is evaporated immediately. Some enters the underground water table. The rest runs back toward the sea. And that's the way it's been for millions of years. The same water, the same air, constantly recycling in our planet's closed system. It all worked well until quite recently, when our species multiplied, covering the earth with its cities, inventing machines to do its work. Life is easier, more comfortable for more people than ever before. 
Distances are swiftly traversed. The heat of summer and the cold of winter are controlled. The darkness of night is dispelled. All of this requires vast amounts of energy. One of the sources of this energy is coal. Coal contains sulfur. Burning coal produces sulfur dioxide. This invisible gas is added to our closed system. Another major source of energy is petroleum. When gasoline or other petroleum products are burned, they break down the nitrogen present in the atmosphere, producing various oxides of nitrogen. These also enter the atmosphere, giving smog its characteristic color, and mix with the sulfur dioxide and other byproducts of our industrial civilization. Ironically, the towering smokestacks erected by industry to clean up the air in the vicinity of their plants serve only to loft the pollutants into the upper atmosphere, where they are transported hundreds or often thousands of miles by the prevailing air currents. The mixture is irradiated by the sun, mixed with water vapor, and transformed into a variety of compounds. Among them, solutions of sulfuric and nitric acids. All this falls back to Earth in the form of rain, snow, or as microscopic particles or droplets called dry deposition. Because of natural sources of sulfur dioxide and the carbon dioxide already present in the atmosphere, normal rainfall is slightly acidic. It averages pH 5.6. But the rain we have just produced has a pH of 4.2, a figure typical of the rain falling today in many parts of the world. It's not strong enough to burn your hands, but over time it has its effects. For instance, a whole winter's acid precipitation can be stored in snow and ice. In the spring, when the snow and ice melt, the acid streams into rivers and lakes, and the level of acid rises sharply. Many creatures can't reproduce in such water. If they do, their offspring are often malformed. In addition, the acids pick up metals, particularly aluminum, which is common in most soils, and carry them in solution into the streams and lakes. The aluminum lodges in the gills of fish, cutting off their supply of oxygen. Whether in this lake in Sweden, or in this stream in upstate New York, their fate is the same. They suffocate. Yet another lake, just a few miles away, has healthy fish. Why? The opposite of an acid is an alkali. Limestone, lye, and ammonia are typical alkalis. Alkalis are substances with a pH higher than 7. If acid is filtered through earth that is rich in alkali, such as lime, its pH level is raised to safe levels. This is called buffering. Unfortunately, most lakes in North America and Europe rest on rock with little buffering capacity. In such a lake on Cape Cod, lime is added in an effort to preserve the fishing. 
climbing deals only with a symptom of acid rain, not its causes, and can never fully restore the rich and varied life of the lakes. Yet in Scandinavia, millions of dollars are spent each year to add lime to the lakes. In another attempt at a short-term solution, Cornell University biologists are selectively breeding brook trout, able to tolerate acidified water. After having spent a year in this pond, the surviving fish in the test group are counted, measured, weighed, and returned to their acidified habitat. Hundreds of scientists in all parts of the world are engaged in basic research on the problem of acid rain. On top of Whiteface Mountain in upstate New York, atmospheric scientists gather samples of ice in an attempt to chart the complex chemistry of how acid rain forms and is transported. Volunteers from the Lake Champlain Committee sample the rain to provide data for a detailed map of acid rainfall. The rain's acidity is measured with indicator papers which change color according to the pH. At the California Institute of Technology, fog is sampled. Acid fog has been measured at pH 1.8. No one can say precisely why millions of trees are dying all over Europe and in parts of the United States. But here at the University of Vermont, studies suggest that the trees raised under acid conditions are less able to take up water. At New York University, volunteers breathe sulfate particles marked with a radioactive tracer. A very sensitive radiation detector measures the time it takes the lungs to expel the particles. Healthy lungs expel the particles quickly. Smokers and those with respiratory disease have more difficulty. The power industry has developed ways of reducing sulfur dioxide emissions, such as burning low sulfur coal, or filtering out the sulfur and other pollutants after it is burned with devices called scrubbers. Such techniques work, but they are costly. Cutting down on our use of energy is an inexpensive and effective way to reduce acid rain. Even if we burn no coal, the burning of gasoline and other petroleum products would keep the acidity of rain above normal. Reduced consumption and cleaner engines are one solution. Nuclear power does not produce acid rain, but many people are worried about its other potential hazards. Power from the wind, Power from the heat of the earth. Power from the sun. Offer attractive alternatives to the burning of coal or oil. But as yet, they supply only a small proportion of our energy needs. There are no easy solutions. With all their efforts, scientists have yet to fully understand the problem of acid rain. Some say we should wait until science provides answers. Others say that as we wait, the damage goes on and may become irreversible. And that we must act now to restore our water and our air. That decision rests with all of us. This water and air cannot be replaced. It's all we'll ever have on this, our life-sustaining Earth.